said that in the last days there would be many deceivers that would go out into the world. Now Paul also said in another place that there would come those preaching another Jesus. And I think this is very important that we need to understand this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is where Paul mentions this. In verse 4, For if there comes preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel. Notice this. There is another Jesus being preached and another gospel. Something that is foreign to the Bible. Something that was not the original Jesus Christ and the original gospel which Jesus brought. Now this is 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. Now this is very startling because could it be the gospels that we hear on many radio stations, television programs that we read in literature, could it be that those gospels are spurious and they're not according to the scriptures? And unless we know and unless we're willing to look into the Bible and let the Bible be our standard, then we're not going to be for sure. Now also, he stated in this same chapter, drop down to verse 13, 14, and 15, <clears throat> excuse me, that there is also false ministers. Look in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Now, think about this for a minute. Before you or I knew a great deal of what this Bible said, weren't we deceived? We didn't realize what it said. We were deceived into probably another gospel. We were deceived into another Jesus, which isn't the Jesus of the Bible. So when a person is deceived, they can be as sincere as the day is long, and yet not even know they're deceived. I was that way, and I admit it. I frankly admit it because I realized where I stood 20, 25 years ago and where I stand today. And I have to come to one conclusion. At one time or another, I was in deception. And if I hadn't have been, how could I have come out of deception? And the only way you can come out of deception is compare what you hear and read with this book, and this is the authority, nothing else. He says in verse 13 that these deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Now, when you read this, this is very sobering. You read that there is another Jesus was being preached, another gospel. So the key that I want to ask today, <clears throat> could there be another gospel? We hear about gospel music. We hear about gospel meetings. We hear about gospel healings. We hear gospel, gospel, gospel continuously. But what if we hear about gospel, 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 but we're never told what that gospel really is? What if we're only told about frills out on the fringes, but we never get to the heart and core of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is? Couldn't this be another form of satanic deception to keep people in the dark as to what the gospel of the kingdom of God really is? I think it is because when we take the line up from 7 o'clock in the morning all the way until sunset or whenever all the religious programming goes off, what do you hear in relationship to the gospel of the kingdom of God? And I want to go through scriptures today showing what the Bible says you must believe or you cannot enter into that kingdom. And then you compare it with what you hear to see if there really is deception going out over the airwaves today. And you see if Jesus Christ with his own words doesn't say that you must believe this gospel or you're deceived. Let's look at it. Turn to Mark 1 verse 14 and 15. This is Jesus Christ coming on the scene. He's born by the Virgin Mary. He grows up. John the Baptist preceded him. And he pointed people to Jesus as the Savior. Here's what he says. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Here is a gospel which is just an old English word which means good news of the kingdom of God. 
And look what he said, though. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is Jesus Christ stating that if you want to be a part of this kingdom of God, number one, you have to repent. Number two, you have to believe this message that he's going to bring. But don't what we mostly hear on radio and television, don't we hear a message about a person called Jesus Christ? But do we ever hear about the message which he brought? Could it be that we're told about Jesus and he is applauded before the masses, which he should be because the scripture says every knee is going to bow to him, but it's the message that he brought concerning this kingdom that is not being preached and therefore the masses of Christianity are deceived into a false gospel and they haven't really received the gospel that Jesus himself brought. It's just a question. I want to open your mind with that because Jesus said to repent and to believe the gospel. Now, what would be a clever deception in order to cover up what repentance is? In order also to cover up any message of the kingdom of God. If I were Satan and I wanted to deceive all of the Christian community into not understanding repentance and also what the kingdom is so I can't accept that message and therefore if I don't believe what the kingdom is then I can't enter into that kingdom. What would I do? Number one, I would tell everybody, I would applaud and I would hold up the person of Jesus, what a wonderful person he was, and then I would turn around and tell him, look, he nailed everything to the cross. Everything back in the Old Testament, you don't have to believe that anymore. That was only up until the cross. And so when you read all the way through the New Testament, that is only a testimony of Jesus. That's all. It mainly is a refinement of some of the points in the Old Testament. That's all. And so when we literally do away with the Old Testament, you have all of the law that God has given that's going to govern the kingdom. And also you have all of the prophecies and you also have covered up, when you do away with the Old Testament, all of the framework for what that kingdom is going to be like when it does come. So what do you have? People preaching Jesus, a gospel of gospel music, of gospel towels they send out. If you'll just send us an offering of $10 or more or $1,000, we'll send you bronze, some kind of statue with your name on it. We'll put your name on our medical center. You have all kind of gospel gimmicks, but none of them are telling you what Jesus Christ said is the gospel. I think we need to explore and I think we need to explore the Bible from every aspect and as many, as, as many of the scriptures that we can look into today. Luke 10, Luke 10 verse 9, because we don't want deception. We want to make sure that all the scales of blindness and a deception are pulled from our eyes. Luke 10 verse 9, this is what Jesus was telling. There were 70 people that he ordained and he sent them out two by two. And when they came back, they, they had healed the sick. And when you go into these cities, this is what Jesus told them. He said, say to the people there, the kingdom is of God is come near unto you. The kingdom of God is come near unto you. Okay, but we need to know what that kingdom is. Turn back now to Luke 9, verse 1 to 2. Luke 9, verse 1 to 2. Notice the commission that he gave his 12 disciples. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Notice what he sent them to do. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So this was what the true ministry of Jesus Christ was to do when they went into communities. They were to preach the truth of what the kingdom of God is. Not the fringes out on the peripheral. Not a peripheral vision, but we're to have a vision where we zero in to the heart and core of what Jesus Christ is talking about. Acts chapter 19. Now notice what Paul did as he went from city to city. Verse 8. Let's see what he preached. Chapter 19 of Acts, verse 8. When Pilate therefore... I'm in the wrong book. <clears throat> Acts 19, verse 8. 
And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. Notice what he did now. This is the Apostle Paul following the directions that Jesus Christ gave him. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now I've got a question. What did he dispute from? What was his evidence? Because you see, until the Apostle John exiled on the Isle of Patmos in 90 AD, put together all the books of the Bible, the only thing extant in those days was the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul had no literature whatsoever other than the vision that he received from Jesus Christ where he was taught three and a half years personally in Arabia. And the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, that's all he had to teach from. So if this is where he gets his information concerning the kingdom, and if Satan were to come along and deceive the Christian community not to look back there, how are you going to know what the kingdom is all about? You're not. It's a great cover-up. It's a cover-up. And I think we need to pull the cover back and see what's behind the cover and see what we've been missing for so long. Acts 20. Notice what else Paul said. In Acts 20, verse 25. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So he went everywhere, everywhere he went. All people that were converted and they believed the preaching of the kingdom of God, this is what he preached to them. The kingdom of God, kingdom of God. And it says it throughout the scriptures. One more time, Acts 28. Acts 28, verse 23. Notice what he said to the people when he was in prison. He was in his own hired house. He knew the possibility was there that he could be put to death for what he believed. Acts 28, verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, these are Jews in the city of Rome, there came many into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus. Notice that. Jesus is a part of the message. Both out of the law of Moses, that's the first five books, and out of the prophets from morning till evening. You can't know what the kingdom of God is unless you go to the Old Testament. The New Testament is nothing but the testimony of Jesus that he came to shed his blood to save us from past sin, from breaking the laws that pertain to the kingdom. And then we can enter into that kingdom and let's go from there and see what it is. But you don't know what the kingdom is unless you go back and study it. That's what he taught from the law of Moses and the prophets. Drop down into verse 31. Here's what he said. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So we hear today many things about Jesus. We do. And he is the heart and core of everything. Without Jesus Christ, the world wouldn't exist. You wouldn't be here because the laws of reproduction would never have been created without Jesus Christ. So the point is, Jesus is the focus of everything, but he preached the kingdom of God and then he expounded how Jesus fit into it. So could it be that we have been in the Christian community told of a gospel and a Jesus, but the wrong Jesus and a wrong gospel? And therefore, we've been converted to a false conversion. Could it be? I think we need to see. And look in your background and whatever religious organization you are in or have been in and maybe have come out of, and look at the teachings which you had in the past or maybe presently have and see if they stack up with the scriptures we're going to see. Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Now remember Paul was called an apostle out of due season. He was called, he was personally trained by Jesus Christ in vision in Arabia for three years. Here's what he says in verse 8 and 9 of chapter 1 of Galatians. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. This is strong words. I would be terrified to stand up on radio, television, or in a pulpit in personal appearances and preach something that this Bible did not say because there is a curse placed on ministers who dare do such. Notice verse 9. As we said before, so I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, 
let him be accursed. That's powerful words. So let's go back now and explore, remembering that we cannot add to nor take away from this Bible because Paul said if any other gospel is preached than what's said in this book, that minister is going to be under a curse. And those who have listened and believed a false gospel are going to be deceived. So I think it only right that we look at only the scriptures and don't twist them. Daniel. This is one called the major prophets. Daniel chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 17 will start out. We'll just set the stage here. Daniel 1, verse 17. There were four people, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel himself. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Here was a supernatural act of God giving understanding to Daniel about visions and dreams. Now notice, King Nebuchadnezzar, who happened to be the ruler of Babylon at this time, he had a vision. And this vision happened to be concerning governments, to be exact, four world-ruling governments. And it was a big, huge statue, and they were broken down according to the value of the metallic, the metallic value of them. And each one began to digress in power the head of gold and so on, all the way down to the feet of toes. Now, I want to pick this up in verse 28 of chapter 2 of Daniel. And there is a God in heaven, says Daniel, that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So the last days, the very days preceding when Jesus Christ returns. You go on down and read the next few verses for yourself on your own time. Verse 32, he identifies the head of, was a fine gold, and this was the Babylonian Empire, and it rose. Notice it was a kingdom. It was a government that literally ruled, and it ruled over people. It had laws of the domain, and it had a head over that government, a king. Then it went on and told about the breast and his arms of silver, belly and so on of brass, and his legs of iron, feet of iron and part clay. But now what I want to pick up is verse 34 and 35. All of these kingdoms were to exist all the way down until, notice, you saw till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Notice now, here were world governments, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire came after that, then you had the Greco-Macedonian Empire, then you had the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, when you read this, you see how it was broken in two parts. The Constantinople was the eastern headquarters. Rome was the western headquarters. And then from there, the final world social system, the ten toes, which is rising today. And then when those ten toes create a world government found in Revelation 13, notice what happens. Here's a stone that's supernaturally cut out of a mountain. And it's going to smash the feet because that's the end of the image. It started at the head and goes all the way down to the toes. That's history written in advance. And it's talking about government, kingdoms, literal kingdoms ruling the earth. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. Now notice what happened. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A worldwide government being set up by someone. A world government that's going to fill the whole earth, that's going to supersede all kingdoms that have ever existed previously. All kingdoms. Now, it's very interesting that he uses the word stone cut out without hands because when you read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, you see very clearly that Jesus Christ is the rock. And he was the rock that led Israel out of the Egyptian bondage. He led them through the Red Sea. He worked all the miracles. He destroyed the Egyptian army. He destroyed their economic system. And he became the Savior of the New Testament, Christ Jesus Christ. So here's a stone that's cut out without hands supernaturally that's going to smash all previous governments and supersede them. Now, let's see if this can be verified by Jesus Christ himself. Revelation chapter 17. 
Remember, the Revelation was the very last book given on the Isle of Patmos in about 90 A.D. It was given to John, and it sealed up the book. This vision, you can't understand the book of Daniel without the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, and then we'll read verse 12 also. You'll notice he's talking about the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend. So all these previous governments, they're called beasts. And you just look it up, the Hebrew or the Greek word, and it just means wild animal, a vicious animal. So God likens Gentile world-ruling governments to vicious animals. They destroy. They don't create and build up for the betterment of their, so the people who are within the, the kingdom. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So there is coming a revival and it's going to be a ten kingdom nation, the toes of that great figure. Look down in verse 12 and it verifies that. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So there is coming a revival of world government. And it's going to be ten kings represented by the ten toes in Daniel 2, verse 38 to 44. Ten toes, going to be ten world, ten global networks or kingdoms giving their power together. So the world is going to be divided up into ten networks, you might say, or uh, different, uh, they're going to partition it into ten separate uh, proportions. And then they're going to give their economic and military strength to this one world ruling governor who is going to be called the beast. Okay, so it's verified. Now let's look in Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16, to see if that stone doesn't come and destroy those ten kingdoms. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge, but notice what else he does, and make war. Have you been told before that Jesus Christ is going to make war? Or has he always been portrayed as a little Lord Jesus laying in a manger, helpless? Or he's sweet, holding his hands together, and he's real skinny, and so pale he looks like he's going to fall over if the wind blows. Isn't that the truth? Look at all the statues and pictures of Jesus. And yet Jesus was a man who built homes from start to finish. He was a powerful man, strong, muscular. And yet he's not portrayed that way in religion today. Look at verse 12. His eyes, this is the person that's coming, were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. The actual Greek word is diadems, meaning many offices that he'll hold. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Genesis 1, 1 to 3 and verse 14 prove the Word was the God of the Old Testament who became flesh and became the Savior of the New Testament, Jesus Christ. So this is Christ coming out of the heavens, and notice what he's going to do. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So he's going to lead armies. Have we been told the gospel before that Jesus Christ is going to overthrow the governments of this earth? Have we? It says so plainly right in scripture. He's going to return and he's going to lead armies. Verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he should smite the nations. This is Jesus of the New Testament. And he should rule them with a rod of iron. World government in the hands of Jesus Christ. But it's going to be a righteous government. It's not going to be the government that we have today where they destroy the earth and destroy your economic standing in society where they make you a nobody, a non-exist person without your number. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is the Jesus that died for us. And yet this is the Jesus that's never talked about on radio and television. 
nor is he talked about in the pulpits. Verse 16, and he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing. Well, you can go on down and read the rest of this chapter. But you can see in verse 19, he takes the beast. He takes the kings of the earth, the false prophets, and they're slain. This is Jesus, the Savior. He's coming to make war, and he's going to set judgment in the earth. But this is not the gospel that's been preached all across the pulpits. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. Jesus Christ is going to return at the seventh trump, the last trump. And notice what's going to happen when that happens, when that trumpet sounds. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms, and we've already seen it in Daniel 2, verse 44. Or actually 28 all the way through 44. There's going to be four world ruling governments. The fourth one will be split up, Constantinople and Rome. Then there will be a revival of ten kingdoms right at the very end. And he's going to smash it. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This is government. This is a kingdom. This isn't sweet platitudes of the little Lord Jesus. And I'm not making fun because we have to understand who Jesus is. He was a baby, a swaddling baby lying in a manger. He was. But he grew up. Let's let him grow up. Let's let him preach us the gospel. We need to become mature in Jesus Christ. We're babes at one time, but we need to grow up too to the fullness of what he taught. John 18. Let's go back and look at his own disciples for a minute. And those people in Galilee, in Judea, surrounding the area which Jesus Christ was born into. John 18, verse 36 and 37. You see, these people were deceived also. Because look at the questions that are going to be asked him. Now, he's already taken. He's appearing before Pilate. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. People take that and they say, see, he's ruling up in heaven now. It's a heavenly kingdom. Well, all you have to do is look up the Greek word. You'll solve your problem. The Greek word just means cosmos, society. Jesus' kingdom is not of this society, this beastly Society which we're a part of today that's run by Satan. But notice what he says. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. He would conquer the kingdom. Have we been told about this Jesus? And yet we've already seen in Revelation that he's going to return and the armies are going to follow him and he's going to slay the beast, the false prophet, and all of his armies. And he's going to conquer and take the kingdom that I should not be delivered to the Jews. So if Jesus' kingdom was to have been established back then, then his servants would have fought, they would have overthrown the Jews who were going to kill him in the Roman Empire. But he says, but now is my kingdom not from here. It's not of this present age, not this society. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? And this is what Jesus said. Do we believe it? You say that I'm a king. To this end, look up the Greek word end, it means purpose. This is the very purpose, kingship, that I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Jesus is going to tell the truth. He said that he was born, this is the very purpose that he came into the world, to reveal his kingship. And that his kingdom was not of this present system, not of this age right now, but of an age yet to come. Okay, now let's go to Luke chapter 1. Let's begin to look at when this age is going to come. Luke 1 verse 31 to 33. Luke 1 verse 31 to 33. This is a prophecy concerning Jesus. And behold, you, Mary, shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, the Son of God, and the Lord God, this is the Father, shall give Jesus the throne of his father David. David ruled on a throne. He had subjects to the kingdom. He had laws of the kingdom. And he had a territory. This is Jesus. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom 
There shall be no end. This is the Jesus of the New Testament. Has he been taught this powerfully? That the scriptures say? All you have to do is read it. It's right there. Now, I want to ask us a question. We've seen these are prophecies of Jesus. Right out of the New Testament, right out of the Old Testament. Can you and I, as individual members of the church of the living God, enter into that kingdom with Jesus Christ and God the Father? That's the key. Can we enter into that kingdom? Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Jesus is going to be, begin to reveal that we can literally enter into that kingdom. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And he said unto him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know. So look what he says. He admits that all the rabbis in that area, this is John 3, verse 2, proof that they knew Jesus Christ was from God. He said, we know that you are a teacher come from God. In their private councils, the rabbis, the Pharisees, and the scribes, and the doctors of the law knew it, and they con confessed it. And he came right forward to Jesus and said it. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, truly, truly, the word verily, verily is properly translated truly, truly. I say unto you, except a man be born, notice the word again, it should say from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is something that you and I must see. We must be able to visually see it. And you cannot see it unless you're born from above. God the Father. Now look at verse 4. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, that's baptism preached all the way through the Bible, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So it's something you can enter into if you meet the qualifications. You can do it. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh, that's you and I, right now in our physical composition, is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit from above, God the Father, is spirit. Our composition becomes spirit. We'll not be the same as we are now. Now, notice what he says, verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born from above, or born again. The wind blows where it lists, or the wind blows wherever it wants to. And you hear the sound thereof, but can't tell where it comes. You can't tell which direction it comes from. You hear it blowing the trees, but you don't see it. It's invisible. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You and I, when we're changed from a flesh spirit, from a flesh body to a spirit body, can literally enter into that kingdom, and we're a part of the universe ruling kingdom of God. Now, let's not just stop there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 identifies the same statements that Jesus just made. And this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, this is Paul under inspiration, that flesh and blood cannot... It's impossible. Look up the word cannot. It means it's an impossibility. Inherit the kingdom of God. You and I in our present physical composition cannot inherit and enter into the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption, which this body corrupts. It grows old and decays and dies. It cannot inherit incorruption or a spirit body that doesn't decay. So Jesus clearly reveals to us that there is coming a kingdom if we meet the qualifications, we can enter into that kingdom. Remember Jesus said, repent in Mark 1 and believe the gospel of the kingdom of God. And Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, which kicked off the New Testament church and the revealing of this kingdom. And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sin. Repent means to change from sinning, breaking the laws that will govern this kingdom. Have all sins forgiven and then start living by the laws that govern that kingdom. 
Because you see, how can you govern in God's kingdom if you're still breaking the laws you're supposed to be enforcing? You can't do it. It just makes sense, doesn't it, when you understand what the kingdom of God is? It's dynamite. Have you been told this before? <laughs> I hope so. But if you haven't, this is the scripture. So we can enter into this kingdom. Now remember that Jesus said his kingdom in John 18, verse 36 and 37, was not of this age. The Greek word A-I-O-N means age. The Greek word cosmos means society in which we live in. So it's not of this present society governed by Satan, but it's after this cosmos, this society is over, the age to come when Satan is going to be destroyed and a seal is going to be set over it. Now, let's go on into that future age. Daniel chapter 7. One of the major prophets again. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 and 18. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So these are world ruling governments. I've already mentioned them. The Babylonian Empire was first. The Greco-Macedonian Empire was the third one. The Medo-Persian was the second one. The Rome was the fourth. Then from Rome, Constantinople and Rome became the two separate seats of government. And then the ten final kingdoms that are coming together right now in the end of this age, that will be the end of man's governments. Verse 18, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. What was those armies in Revelation chapter 19 following Jesus on white horses and in clothing clean and white? This is who it was. The saints of the living God who repented and got in harmony with the laws that are going to govern the kingdom and they believed the gospel of what that kingdom was. Not another gospel. Not a spurious gospel. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So the saints of God led by Jesus. That's why it said he was going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Because you see, saints are going to become kings and priests ruling with Jesus Christ. We're the ones who's going to take the kingdom led by our leader, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ which you and I must believe. We must believe it in order to enter into that kingdom. Now, Matthew chapter 24 in the New Testament. Jesus gave a whole list of events that you could look forward to to determine when he was going to return. I'm going to skip through many of those and just drop down to verse 26 to 30. Matthew 24, 26 to 30. Wherefore, if they, these are the prophets today, the ministers, if they shall say unto you, behold, Jesus is in the desert. Hey, look, don't go out there. Behold, Jesus is in the secret chambers. He's had a secret rapture. Look, don't believe it. He's come back secretly. He's in New York City. He's hiding, waiting for the right time to reveal himself. Don't believe it. Verse 27, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Notice now, when he's going to come from the east to the west, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heavens, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then, after all of this has happened, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? Because they're going to see Jesus Christ leading an army back to this earth. But you see, the deception has been so great. And they're going to be sucked in because people are being told they're going to, they're going to be secretly raptured seven years before Christ returns. So they won't have to go through the tribulation with this end time beast power. And they're being told that all across the television networks and the ministries on radio today. As a direct result, when this beast power, the Antichrist, rises up, they're going to be sucked into his kingdom and worship him as God because, you see, they're not already raptured away. Because, you see, those who are preaching this theory say that in 1948, Israel fulfilled prophecy, they became a nation. And within one generation of 40 years, 
Jesus would stand on the earth. That's 1988. If they're going to be raptured seven years before that, why aren't they gone in 1981? You see, this is already causing problems in the religious community among those who are teaching this rapture seven years before Christ returns. And I want to show you a scripture in a minute. It says nobody knows the day or hour, so why are people setting dates? You can only look at the trends and see approximately by what Jesus said. And you set a date, you're in trouble. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels, and with a great sound of a trumpet, they shall gather together his elect. That's when we're going to be raptured, if you want to use that term, which isn't even found in the Bible. We'll be caught up to meet Jesus in the air from one end of the heaven to the other and the angels are going to catch us up to meet Jesus. We're going to inherit the kingdom and then we're going to be assigned our rulership positions and then we're going to descend to this earth with Jesus Christ. We're going to smash the governments of this earth and we're going to possess the kingdom. This is the gospel, the good news that at last after all these 6,000 years a righteous government is going to be established once and for all on planet Earth. And Satan and his demons, who is influencing the governments today for unrighteousness, will be eliminated. And for once and for all, we will execute proper and righteous judgments in the Earth. But you see, there is no secret rapture because it says every eye is going to see Jesus Christ return. So you and I aren't going to be caught up and suddenly one of us is an airplane pilot and there's 247 people on that airplane and it crashes because the pilot has disappeared. Oh no, that's not going to happen seven years previous to Jesus Christ returning. We're going to be caught up at the last trump after the tribulation just like Jesus Christ said with his own mouth. If we can't believe Jesus Christ, we may as well fold up the book, go home, burn it just like they tried to do in the Middle Ages, and forget it all. Jesus said after the tribulation is when you and I and everybody on earth are going to see the sign of his coming. And then the angels would go out with a blast of the great trump and gather all Christians. That's when we're going to be changed from this flesh body to a spirit body. We're going to be born from above, just like Jesus said in John 3, 1 to 8. Let's go on and explore just a little further. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> Luke chapter 13, verse 28 and 29. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the fathers and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you, the Jews of that day who wouldn't believe him, who rejected him, were thrust out. And they shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. You see, the angels are going to go to all four corners of the earth and are going to gather the saints. And they're going to sit down in the kingdom of God. It's going to be a government. And we are going to be a portion rulership. And we're going to bring righteousness to the inhabitants of this earth. Hebrews chapter 11 shows that all those people, the Old Testament times, were willing, if necessary, even to be sawed in asunder and sawed in half. In Hebrews chapter 11, this is the chapter called faith chapter by most people. And this is where these people actually were looking forward into the future. They didn't look to the governments surrounding them in their day, but they were looking forward to a government that was to come. Verse 13, let's read it. Talking about all these men of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having been or seen them afar off. Remember, Jesus said his kingdom is not of this age, not of this society. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's us. We're strangers, pilgrims. We're not to become embroiled in the society of today because we're looking for a government to come in which we're going to participate in. Drop down to verse 39 and 40. These all, having obtained a better report through faith, receive not the promise. They're in the grave. They're waiting for us. Look at this, verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us that they, those of faith in the Old Testament, should, without us should not be made perfect. 
They're laying in the grave waiting for us. And when that seventh trump sounds, we're all going to be resurrected together and changed in an instant. And we're all going to be caught up to meet Jesus, return to this earth, and establish the kingdom of God. This means there will be no secret rapture of the saints because it says that those who have already died in faith will not precede us. They're laying there waiting in the grave. Without us, they're not going to be made perfect and be given that perfected body. They're waiting for us. So that means that we can't be changed seven years ahead of time because then we would have gone before them. If they can't go before us, what gives us the right to go before them? It just don't make sense, see? It's looking for a way of escape. In other words, it's a pansy religion. Okay? It is. You have to call it the way it is. Okay, Luke chapter 19. This identifies very clearly what Jesus said in regards to when his kingdom would come because, you see, people wanted to know, when is your kingdom going to appear? Is it coming right now? Jesus explains that. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And as they heard these things that Jesus was preaching, he added and spoke a parable. Notice now, Jesus had already said in Mark 13, or Mark chapter 10, I believe it is, verse 13, that he spoke, he spoke in parables so people would not understand what he was saying. He didn't want them to be converted at that time. He's not trying to convert the whole world now. He'll do that when he returns. But notice what he said. He spoke in parables because he was near to Jerusalem and look, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They wanted him to become king right then, overthrow the military rule of the Roman Empire and establish his world government. He says, oh no, he'd already said, and when he, well he did later when he was on trial for his life, my kingdom's not of this age, it's for yet a future time. So he went on and gave a parable. Verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman, and this is Jesus Christ, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So this is Jesus going to heaven, and at a certain period in the future, he would return with that kingdom. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. In other words, use this. Each one of them had a talent or a pound whatever you want to call it, certain amount of ability, economic, um, economic power, plus your own God-given talent and ability, which you have. And they were to occupy and use these things, preaching the kingdom of God until Jesus came. Then, let's go on down. I don't want to read this whole thing. When he did return, verse 16, then came the first saying, Lord, your pound has gained 10 pounds. <clears throat> Notice what Jesus said to this person who was a follower of his. He said unto him, Well, you good servant, because you've been faithful in a little, he only had a little to work with, but look what he did. He got out and preached the gospel. Have you authority over ten cities? This is government. This is the kingdom of God. He's going to rule over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. And Jesus said, Likewise, you be you also over five cities government, mayors, governors, whatever we're going to be called in the kingdom, probably kings. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is your pound. I've kept it laid up in a napkin. In other words, I didn't want to take a chance on losing what belonged to you. I didn't want to put my life on the firing line for you. For I feared. Look up the word feared in an unabridged dictionary. It's the opposite of faith. The exact opposite. And it even means if you're a little apprehensive, just a little apprehensive, he feared. And the scripture says in Revelation 21, 8, that the fearful and unbelieving will not enter into the kingdom of God. We have to overcome even the slightest bit of apprehension. We do, but it takes time, you see. That's spiritual growth. We're not all spiritual giants the minute we believe. <laughs> It takes time. For and this man feared, and he never overcame that fear. Because you are an austere man. In other words, it's tough to enter into the kingdom of God. Because it says in, in uh, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Because they're not willing to pay the price. Well, Jesus said this man feared. And that he was a tough master. 
and yet he's merciful. You take up where you haven't laid down and you reap where you didn't sow. And so Jesus, in verse 22, said to this man, he said, out of your own mouth will I judge you, wicked servant. He was wicked and he was slain before Jesus because he did not do anything to spread the word of the kingdom of God. Nothing whatsoever. He just sat there on his posterior, never mentioned the name Jesus Christ, never got on the firing line for the kingdom of God to tell people that the government of God is going to supersede the evil governments that are ruling us today. This is a part of the gospel. Well, verse 27 will be the final verse in this particular passage that I want to mention. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring here and slay them before me. So you see, Jesus is not just the little Lord Jesus. He's, he's told us we cannot kill. But you see, once we become sons of the living God, God then who gave life also can take it. And those who have violated his law can have their life taken back from them because they are not obedient to his everlasting covenant by which he will give them eternal life. So God is going to take that life from them. So he's showing that our rulership will be based upon what we do and how productive we are in this life with the capabilities that we have now. Let's turn back to Daniel now. Daniel once again, chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And let's see some more interesting things about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, this is Daniel once again receiving this information, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. Here's Jesus in the heavens because he's already been crucified and now he's risen and he's ascended to the Father in the heavens and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father intervening for us. His shed blood, he's putting on the mercy seat every time we come to him and say, Father, I sin, forgive me in the name of Jesus Christ. He sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat. Our sins are forgiven. He's our high priest today intervening between us and the Father for our sins. That's his job now. Well, he's now appearing before God the Father about to be crowned to receive a kingdom. Look at this thrilling episode. And they brought Jesus near unto God the Father. I'm just supplying the nouns instead of the pronouns. And there was given Jesus dominion and glory. Dominion means rulership and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. And what did it say in Revelation 13, 7 and 8 talking about the beast? It said all nations, languages, and kingdoms and tongues would serve him. This is government. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. This is the good news that we need to be preaching. And this is verified in Acts, the third chapter. Practically the same words. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. <clears throat> Jesus is being talked about. And he says, repent. And what did Jesus come on the scene saying? In Mark 1, 14 to 15, repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom of God. Here Peter, or whoever it is that's talking here, says, repent you therefore and be converted, have an amendment of life, get in harmony with the laws that are going to govern the kingdom, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord, this is God the Father, shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Restitution means a restoring of God's government to this earth, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And yet if I was Satan and didn't want you to know the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of God, I'd say the Old Testament's done away, don't read it. And yet right here in the New Testament it says... This kingdom has been preached by all the prophets. There's not a book in the Old Testament that doesn't preach it. And if we close that book, the Old Testament, we'll never know what the kingdom of God really is. Well, back to Daniel chapter 7 now, and we'll complete this section. <clears throat> Verse 16 and 17. 
I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked. This is Daniel in vision. And he asked the truth of all this. He wanted to know. He wanted to understand. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things which he had been seeing in this vision. Verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall rise, arise out of the earth. Governments. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Drop down to verse 21 and 22. And I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. This is the same thing as Revelation 13 verse 7. The final beast is going to kill saints, martyr saints, give persecution to saints. Until, notice how long it's going to last. Until, verse 22, Daniel 7, the ancient of days came, he crowned Jesus Christ, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. What are Christians living for? What are they denying this world for today except to possess this kingdom? There is no other reason. That's why we are repenting of breaking the laws of God and getting in harmony with them so that we can execute these laws in God's kingdom when it's established. It's, doesn't it make sense? A kingdom has to have laws. They're God's laws if it's God's kingdom. God's laws have never been done away with and nailed to the cross as we're told so many times. All of this that we've seen in Daniel 7 is verified in the New Testament. We'll take a look at just a couple of quick scriptures. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. This is Jesus himself, the revelator. Jesus himself. To him, that's the saints, any person on earth who will follow Jesus Christ. To him that overcomes. Notice it's not to him that just calls upon the name of Jesus. He's an overcomer. He changes his life from breaking the laws of the kingdom to obeying the laws of the kingdom and writing them in his heart and in his mind. To him that overcomes will I, Jesus Christ, grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. That's clear. That's just one scripture. Turn back to chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. Another very clear scripture. And this is written to the churches. Chapter 2 and 3 are to the seven churches. These are the saints. Verse 26. He that overcomes, or any Christian, a follower of Jesus that overcomes and keeps my works. There are works. And we must keep those works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. That's clear. And he... That person who's an overcomer and keeps the works of Jesus, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Brethren, we're going to execute and bring about righteousness in this earth. And once righteousness prevails, the mercy of God is going to be poured out. But at first, we're going to have to put down the rebellious nations and the satanically influenced leaders and armies. We just are. Read Psalms 149 verse 4 to 9 on your own sometimes. And it says it's going to be an honor for the saints to return with Jesus Christ, take the government leaders of this earth and bind them in fetters of iron because they're destroying the earth and the inhabitants of it and it's going to be an honor for us to stop this destruction. That's why we have to change and become the good guys now, see? So we can wear the white hats to match our white horses as we return from the heavens with Jesus Christ. Luke 1, Luke 1 verse 32. Once again, this is the same period of time that we've talked about before where it was prophesied to Mary that Jesus would be a ruler. <clears throat> Luke 1 verse 32. He shall be great, this is Jesus, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So it is a throne, it's rulership, it's government. And then in Acts 1, Acts 1, verse 6 to 9, notice how beautifully this is portrayed. Jesus lays it out. He's about to ascend into the heavens. And the disciples wouldn't see him anymore. He had already appeared to them in his glorified state. Acts 1, verse 6 to 9. And when they therefore came together, they asked of Jesus, saying, Lord, 
Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the, which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's our job today is to witness of Jesus and of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And when we come on radio and we talk syrup, instead of what Jesus said, we're preaching another gospel and another Jesus. Verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. That's why we will never have great, huge audiences in 10,000 seat auditoriums. Because you see, when you preach the pure, unadulterated word of God, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They want to preach, they want somebody to preach smooth things to them and say everything is going to be all right. We won't have to go through the tribulation. We won't have to be persecuted. Just give us Jesus and everything is wonderful. No, it's not. When you become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, he said that he was killed and how are we better than he is? He said, if they've done it to me, the master, how much worse is it going to be for you, my servants? That's hard. That's why he said, few there be that enter into that gate because few have the spiritual backbone to go all the way with Jesus Christ. And that's why he said, before you become a Christian, you count the cost. No builder starts to build a building unless he sits down to see if he has the money to build it or else people will laugh at him and say, ha-ha, you started something you couldn't finish. It's the same way with Christianity because this is hard. And you see, rulership over the whole earth is something that men have aspired to ever since Abel or Cain killed Abel. Rulership and dominion over other people. God is going to only give it to the humble. He's going to resist the proud. Those that won't submit to him are going to be cast aside and the humble are going to be exalted. So let God do it his way. We'll see that kingdom. Just a couple of more scriptures now and I want to bring it to a close today. Matthew 24, <clears throat> verse 36. This is the chapter, the Olivet chapter, where he foretells many events that are going to occur leading up to his return. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. So let's never set dates and let's never try to say other than what world conditions specify. Luke 21. Luke 21, the parallel chapter, verse 25 to 32. And there, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. How could this be? Don't we realize that right now, Kessley, around the turn of the century, invented such inventions where you can literally create earthquakes today. You can destroy whole cities through his inventions and the Soviet Union has these. They were given straight from our patent office in Washington, D.C. They are right now creating huge, gigantic, low, extremely low frequency magnetic waves that's diverting the jet stream and causing drought in the summer. Extremely high temperatures. And then they'll send, divert the jet stream and send coal waves right down through the heartland of the United States of America today. And we've already seen it two to three times now. And the United States is now, and I have the documentation from it, from the Canadian government, showing all of these things are possible, man-made. We can literally cause the earth now to go out of orbit because of these huge standing electromagnetic waves. Just like scripture says, and men's heart will fail them for fear. And yet we're doing it to ourselves because we're breaking down the building blocks that have held the earth in its orbit. Men are doing it today. We'll have an article on that in the magazine. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man. So after these, all of these magnetic powers that are holding the earth in orbit are going to start to be shaken. And there is a scripture in the Old Testament, I didn't write it down here, but it literally says the earth will reel out of orbit like a drunk man. 
because of what we're doing to it. And so it'll be extreme cold and then extreme heat because we'll come closer to the sun and further away. And we're breaking down the ionosphere. We're doing all these things to ourselves. So you see, Jesus was right. He knew what we were going to be discovering. But notice what he said. He said, when these, verse 28, <clears throat> and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. If you've met the qualifications, repent and believe the gospel, the unadulterated gospel Jesus gave. And he spoke to them a parable of a fig tree. And I'll just summarize it. He says, when you see the little sprouts coming out in leaves, you know that summer is close. He said, when you begin to see all of these events, then know that the kingdom of God is near. And when it is near, you look up and suddenly we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And we, the saints, are going to inherit the kingdom.